And I believe we are live. So hello everyone and welcome to the Riverwood Conservancy's webinar of Wolves with Dave Taylor. My name is Stephanie. I'm the Community Program Coordinator at the Riverwood Conservancy. I hope you are all enjoying this beautiful long weekend. I want to say a special thanks to Credit Valley Conservation for supporting all of the work we do. And before we get started today, I just want to mention that all of our June programs are now on our website. So please register at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash events. On your screen now, you should see the entire calendar of virtual events. One program that is left this May is 42 Mammals and Where to Find Them in the City, which is this Thursday at 7 p.m. with Andrew Budziak. As well, since we are all stuck at home, if your family, club, or community group are interested in a virtual program such as Healing with Nature, Trivia Nights, wildlife specific programs and more please register at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash virtual discovery and if you would like to support our programs and conservations of riverwood land please consider donating at the riverwoodconservancy.org slash donate and before we get to our wonderful speaker this afternoon the riverwood conservancy would like to acknowledge that the land on which we operate is the territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional homeland of the Anishinaabe, Wendat, and Haudenosaunee Nations. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties and is within the lands protected by the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this place is still home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people, and we are grateful to have the opportunity to live and work on this land. And today, we have Dave Taylor, who is a wildlife photographer and the author of more than 40 books on wildlife and ecology. He has produced educational videos and material about wildlife and school curriculums. He's taught science and geography for more than 30 years and nature photography and writing for more than 25 years. Dave is also the education program consultant at the Riverwood Conservancy. So welcome, Dave. And we also have a longtime volunteer for the Riverwood Conservancy, Linda, with us today. A huge thanks to Linda for helping us out on a holiday. And if you have any questions during the presentation, please type them in the Q&A chat, the chat bar, or comment section, and we will address them at the end of the presentation. So Dave, I will hand it over to you. Thanks so much. Thanks, Stephanie, and welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about wolves today. and. Let's get this big question out of the way. There are no wolves at Riverwood uh, or even in Mississauga. And I have done a talk earlier on coyotes. You may have seen that and we've kind of addressed that. Let me begin by introducing you to the wolf. This is the wolf skull. And it is typical of most of the, uh, the dog family, the canine family. It's got sharp teeth. These teeth are used for puncturing. These teeth are used for cutting. And most particularly, these teeth back here are called carnicials. <clears throat> and the carnicials act like scissors. And that's what gives the carnivore family their name from these teeth. What happens is the upper tooth cuts outside the lower tooth and shears the meat. And if you watch a dog or a cat or a lion or a wolf, chewing, they're going to chew on the side of their mouth. Other features that are prominent in the skull is the sagittal crest. This is where muscles are anchored and they go down and pull the jaw up and down. You notice that the eyes are facing frontwards and very prominent the ears, the back. So this is the skull of Canis lupus, the wolf. And we're going to meet the wolf in person. Um, there's a lot of scary tales about wolves, and we will address some of those, I think, later on. But let's start by going to a slideshow I put together. So I'm going to share the screen. Those of you that are frequent visitors will know this sometimes goes well, sometimes not so much. And Stephanie, you should be seeing the slideshow. Ah, I'm getting a thumbs up, so off we go. So the talk of the title of this talk is of wolves. That comes from a book uh, called Of Wolves and Men, and we're going to concentrate mostly on the wolves. So this is the wolf talk. Now let's see if I can get this to work. Okay, back up one slide. So 
Well, first of all, I'll introduce the coyote again into this. The wolf, today's wolf, is a relatively new arrival. The coyote has been here much longer, and there's a complex relationship between the two. Going back three million years ago, this would have been the wolf family. You'll notice that there were actually coyotes at one point, quite a long time ago, that were as large as the wolves. And there was a type of wolf called the dire wolf that was actually larger than the wolves we know today. The name game, what do you call these animals? This really crops up when you're talking about coyotes, but a lot of people will refer to a coyote as a wolf and they're not wolves. They are wolf-like, they are wolf relatives, but when we're talking the gray wolf, the coyote, it's not a wolf. It's definitely got its own category. Wolves are very distinct from the coyote family, as you'll see. Today in North America, we have four races. I'm not sure they would actually qualify for subspecies, but there are four races of wolves. There's the Arctic wolf, which lives in the far north, the gray wolf, which lives across most of Canada and Alaska, the Pacific coastal wolf, which lives on the Pacific coast, and the Mexican wolf, which was largely extirpated and has been saved from extinction uh, by a few dedicated conservationists and, of course, the United States uh, Wildlife Service. Coyote and wolf range. The coyote 7,000 years ago was primarily confined, according to the fossil record, to the Great Plains and the desert areas. The wolf range in North America basically encompassed the rest. Just kind of didn't get into Florida, although I'm not sure that that's 100% correct. But the wolf basically covered most of North America. Certainly, <clears throat> there were wolves living where we were living, or we were living 7,000 years ago. And this is kind of your family tree of wolves. You'll notice the wolf is the fourth, third animal from the bottom. They are very, very distantly related from the top animal, which is the Arctic fox. Then you see the red fox. And as you come down, the very bottom, you'll see the bear family, which the wolves, the bears, and the weasels all belonged, all shared a common ancestor millions of years ago. The wolf and the coyote are quite closely related. The wolf and the dog are even more closely related. These are North America's dogs. Various foxes on the left, on my left anyhow, and the wolves on the other side. What happened was about three million years ago, a common ancestor of wolves and coyotes migrated across a land bridge into Asia. And that's where the species we know as wolves evolved. And they would spread from there across the northern part of Africa, through Europe, through Asia. They would come back into North America about 400,000 years ago. Most of their range expansion in North America was, a, was blocked in effect by the glaciers. Meanwhile, the coyotes were left here without any wolf interaction and they evolved in a separate way. And they basically evolved into two species, the uh, coyote itself and what was called the red wolf. The Algonquin wolf doesn't come into the picture quite as soon as this graphic indicates. Then about 4,000 years ago, the wolf comes back in. It has to contend with dire wolves, saber-toothed tigers, American lions, American cheetahs, the megafauna that existed here until about 20,000 years ago. The wolf was kind of there, but it wasn't a major player. Then came the great die-off, which ended about 11,000 years ago, and most of its competitors disappeared and the wolf was left as the main predator. Now, gray wolves have a different prey list than, say, coyotes. So gray wolves prey on large mammals, moose, bison, muskox, elk, black bear, and mule deer. As, um, 
And it, it, the best way to prey on those animals is to have a pack. When you get into the smaller prey, white-tailed deer, elk calves, mule deer, and bison calves, wolves are certainly capable of getting it. And in some places, coyotes will also form packs and prey on them. When it gets to the small mammals, ground squirrels, uh, rabbits, pronghorn calves, birds, cats and dogs, that's pretty much where the coyote takes over. It is in that blue area that they compete. And that competition, as you see, as you will soon see, is kind of important to the story. Why do they die? Well, coyotes and wolves die from a variety of causes, diseases, accidents, interspecies competition, where wolves <coughs> kill coyotes, and interspecies competition, where the species kills members of their own type. The number one, not surprisingly, is human activity human control, car accidents, hunting and trapping. Even so, they are both doing better today than they were doing. This is a wolf with distemper. There's an animal in Africa called the painted wolf, which is better known as the wild dog. And it looks like a wolf, behaves like a wolf, but it's not a wolf. It has a different number of toes. It's genetically quite distantly related to wolves, but it shares several features. It is a pack hunter and goes after larger mammals. And it does share food with other members of the pack. So the social uh, activity of wolves seems to have, or dogs in particular, seem to have evolved in other places. This is a jackal. This is a blackback jackal, and it is not a wolf. This in Africa is the golden jackal, also found in Asia. And it is a wolf, and it has just been reclassified in the last decade. It is definitely a wolf. And like a wolf, it sometimes uh, exists in packs. But like the coyote, sometimes those packs are relatively small and confined to the current year's offspring and maybe a daughter helping out. So. In 1800s, Europeans have arrived, new weapons are being developed, and this is what the wolf range looked like. The red wolf was confined to the south. The Algonquin wolf had come into existence about the year 650 BC, uh, AD rather. Um, and the gray wolf still ruled most of the continent. That would change very quickly. As a result of overhunting and management and just plain animosity, the gray wolf was pretty much eradicated from the United States. Pacific Coast wolf did okay. It held its own. The Arctic wolf was too far north to be bothered with. And wolves in Canada generally fared well. The Mexican wolf pretty much disappeared. And it is due to the actions of particularly a man by the name of Ted Turner, who had a huge landowner. You might know Ted Turner from uh, Turner Classic Movies, CNN. He was very wealthy and he had this huge ranch where he reintroduced Mexican wolves into the United States. It was a bit controversial, but it was his property. And so the wolf managed to do very well there and has since started to spread and still relatively rare. The coyote blossomed. It's everywhere. It did really, really well because its major predator, the wolf, was gone. The red wolf uh, is extinct as far as I know in the wild. There may be a few in, um, I think it's uh, South Carolina, uh, that may still exist, but by and large, it has been bred out of existence by coyotes. It was very close to coyotes. In any case, where you see red wolves now are going to be mostly in zoos or in very protected habitats. It is a beautiful animal, about the size of a coyote, and a lot redder than the coyote. However, I've seen some very red coyotes. 
The Algonquin or Eastern wolf is threatened. And it is the wolf that as the coyote started to move out of the plains and the wolf started to move north, there was some crossbreeding going on apparently. And about 650 years ago, um, this species resulted from the breeding of coyotes and wolves and then became very well established across eastern part of um, North America, uh, particularly north of Superior, across the Algonquin Park area, and into Quebec. Why it did well there at the exclusion of the gray wolf, I really don't know. It's a mystery, and um, it certainly seemed to fare well. And it fared, I think, even better because uh, when the white-tailed deer moved into the north, it was a prey better suited for it. There's a wide range of colors in wolves, not nearly the range in coyotes, although coyotes come close. I have seen a very pale coyote and I've seen a very dark coyote. Wolves range from white to black. The black wolf is a relatively new color phase and in a recent book called The Wolves of Yellowstone, they've published the research on this. And they think about 20, 30,000 years ago, I may be wrong in the date a little bit, wolves bred with dogs. And some of the dogs happened to have black genes and that created the black wolf. <clears throat> and so anyone who says, including what I used to say that wolves breeding with dogs was very rare. It apparently does happen and it happened sometime 20,000 years ago, probably happened in Eastern Asia. Uh, a lot of the wolves in Europe, I think, as far as I can see and have read, are mostly gray. The black wolf is more common in North America than it is other places for sure. And some black wolves turn quite gray as they age. So, Breeding between the animals, wolves certainly will breed with coyotes. Coyotes will breed with wolves. The extent of it will really vary. Used to think that it was very rare. And if a talk I would have done four or five years ago, I would have said very unusual, very rare. But new genetic work has thrown that out. And it is not unusual for similar species to crossbreed. It is unusual for them to have fertile offspring. And if they do have offspring, most of them are infertile and of course the breed dies out. But sometimes there is a fertile offspring. And when that happens from studies done, the fertile offspring breeds like crazy and it becomes very well established and a new species may result. And that's pretty much, I think, what's happening to the coyote in Eastern Ontario and Eastern States. It is becoming a new species. If you're out and you look for tracks, the dog size is very, very variable. So it's not bigger or smaller. There are dogs that are bigger than wolves. There are dog tracks, obviously, that are smaller than a coyote's. What you want to look at are the toes. In the coyote, the toes point like this. In a dog, they point straight. In the wolf, they're kind of like this. If you're way out in the bush in the north and you see dog tracks, you can pretty much assume they're wolf. The Pacific Coast is where the Pacific wolf lives. And it used to be thought it was just a gray wolf until they started to do DNA studies, they realized it had been isolated for a while. And unlike other wolves, it preys a lot on black bear, amazingly. And also the local deer, the black-tailed deer. And it is a fish eater, but it will also eat crustaceans. It has a very different diet from uh, wolves other places. Black bear are not on the menu very often in other places in wolf range. This is a very attractive wolf. Most of them seem to have this type of coloration. Further north, you run into the Arctic wolf. Uh, 
primarily a prey that preys on caribou and muskox, all sorts of wonderful documentaries done about this. They will prey on doll sheep, where the doll sheep are found. They're very versatile, very large wolf. They're not that common. I've only seen a few in my lifetime and I haven't been in the Arctic nearly enough, but I have seen them and they do strike you as being very big. Certainly as big as a black bear in many cases, although I don't think pound for pound. And now we get into the realm of the gray wolf and its prey. And it generally preys on larger animals and larger animals have learned to group together. This is called the selfish herd. So we all get together and we figure that the slowest one of us is the one that's going to fall prey. So when I go out photographing bears, I always make sure I have somebody I can outrun. Um, that's kind of the attitude. Now, in all honesty, I'd be the guy that anybody else could outrun. The wolves will go along and they will test. And most of the wolf pictures you're going to see are from, a, from Yellowstone Park. The wolves were introduced into Yellowstone, reintroduced into Yellowstone after a 75 year absence. And that was in 1995. And when I was photographing these animals was in the early 2000s. Um, you still see them, but from about 2000, 2010, that was the heyday for wolf viewing you know, in Yellowstone. It was amazing. Yellowstone is great because you have these open vistas and you can see large distances it's like being in Africa and you can watch predator prey. In this case, a wolf has come up to a buffalo herd. Now the wolf was full. If you look at her, she's got a huge belly, distended belly. If the bison are bulls, they pretty much ignore the wolf unless there's a pack. These two bulls didn't even pay any attention when this wolf came out behind them. But with that herd of bison calves, as soon as the wolf trotted away, that herd departed for places well distant. The wolf is a, a hunter and it spends a lot of its day in its pack looking for food. Watching them hunt is a really unique experience. The elk bunched together and when you see a herd of elk bunched like this, start looking for wolves. If you see them spread out feeding, you know that, that's, that they're not going to be around. When the elk start to get nervous and move off, you can tell that there's something going to happen. So one day we were set up and suddenly the elk came barreling over the edge of this um, ridge and behind them were six or seven wolves. And it was really dramatic. The wolves closed in, the elk kept going. You can see there's a bull towards the back with young antlers. The wolves came pretty close. One of the elk decided to take refuge in the river. Now in reality, see being a, a journalist, I can doctor reality a little bit. In reality, this elk escaped and the wolf trotted off. But what happened in a lot of cases, and unfortunately, I may be fortunate for you, I never got to see it until it was out, over. But wolves are really good in the water. And these rivers aren't that deep. And wolves are good swimmers. And I would have to say that most of the elk kills that I saw with wolves feeding on them were along the banks of one of the rivers in Yellowstone. This is a cow elk that they brought down. And the wolves would come in. They were very uh, protective. Wolves interact a lot around food. It's kind of dramatic to watch. If you see ravens flying in, the raven follows the wolf. And in Yellowstone in particular, but also in Algonquin Park, the presence of a lot of ravens could really indicate that there are wolves about. Bald eagles are another indicator. This is just like watching in Africa when the lions run in and they, they chase after the, the vultures that have gotten the food. You'll notice in the foreground a coyote. The coyote has come in to investigate the kill. He's looking for an opportunity to feed on that elk. 
And another time, a grizzly bear is either confiscated or killed an elk. I think probably confiscated. And it was feeding on it. One of the wolves, you can see it on the side there, came back. And the grizzly bear tried to chase the wolf off. The wolf, and you notice the size difference here. The wolf isn't that much smaller than this grizzly. But one wolf and one grizzly, the grizzly's going to take precedence. And eventually the grizzly escorted the wolf off. The wolf came back with a buddy. And the grizzly was escorted off. By then the grizzly had probably fed enough. And notice down in the corner, the coyotes come in again. Wolves do not like coyotes being around them. Coyotes steal their food. Coyotes are small wolves. Wolves don't like other packs of wolves. And a group of coyotes, a pack of coyotes, is, is treated the same way. Wolves hate coyotes. This is a young yearling wolf threatening a coyote. And you can see the size difference. The wolves have discovered this coyote's den. And they were busily digging at it. And there was nothing the coyote could do. This was such a dramatic thing to watch. The coyote circled, they yelped. There were two of them, the mother and father. But the wolves kept digging the den out. And eventually, they got to the puppies and they killed every puppy. And not just even the next day, we saw the same thing happen again on a den that was further away. The den was buried in these trees. The wolves got in and they too dug out all of the puppies. Wolves will hunt coyotes. And they do not to eat them. They do it to get rid of them. And when the wolves arrived in Yellowstone in 1995, the coyote population plummeted. And that had a wide ranging effect on the, the animals. With the, without the wolves back in the year 1920, when the wolves were extirpated, the coyotes were free to do what they wanted to do. Let's talk a little bit about humans before we come back to the coyote story. We think of wolves as bad animals, at least we used to. And that's because our European ancestors, and I'm talking, um, I guess, European people mainly, they had wolves killing their deer and they didn't like it. And the wolf was a bad animal. But for the Plains Indians and the tribes of the Southwest, they felt the wolf was a benefactor because the wolf ate deer and the deer were eating their crops, the people's crops. So they had a completely different attitude and wolves were tolerated. But as Europeans came into Europe, into North America, they brought their attitudes and the negative attitude towards wolves. They also, brought a negative attitude towards the indigenous people. And they also brought diseases, which wiped out <clears throat> the indigenous people. Two thirds of their numbers died because not of warfare, but because of introduced diseases. That opened up the land for cattle ranching and cattle ranchers do not like wolves. So they began a process of getting rid of the wolves. They trapped them and they poisoned them. They would use baited carcasses. And pretty soon, the wolf was eradicated from the continental United States, except for a few up in northern Michigan and Wisconsin, where they continued to survive. Now, this allowed the coyote to expand its numbers. And one of the animals that was really uh, impacted by this was the pronghorn antelope. Pronghorn are an indigenous North American species. They can outrun wolves. Wolves don't bother with them. But coyotes will look for the young pronghorn antelope when they are left by their mother. So this animal is left alone. Coyotes were pretty adept at smelling them. And so pronghorn numbers suffered. They also suffered from fencing that blocked off their migration routes. So it was a two-pronged attack. The Europeans had unleashed a new predator, a major predator on pronghorns, and they had stopped the pronghorns from following their migration routes. Meanwhile, attitudes were changing about wolves. And 
the public was becoming more urbanized. And books like Farley Mowat's Never Cry Wolf, which was basically taken from a study done by Olive Murray, uh, it changed the attitude of people. It popularized wolves. We were starting to see them for their good qualities, their, the way they raise their families. And wolves are really good parents. Now, one of the myths that you'll read is that wolves only allow the top alpha and beta female to breed. That's not true. Studies in Yellowstone have really shaken up our understanding of wolves. We now know that there could be several females within a pack that will breed. Sometimes there's only one. The whole pack does look after the youngsters. They will take the youngsters starting around up here in July and August, they'll take them to their kills. And the youngsters can quite get quite aggressive around kills. They'll chase their parents off, but it's tolerated behavior. If mom and dad really don't want the youngsters there, they can enforce their rules. There's a real bond between these animals and most of the females will stay with the pack. The male pack puppies will sometimes leave. They'll go off on their own because they want to form their own pack and they're not going to be permitted to breed with their mothers or their aunts or their sisters. So they leave the pack. Sometimes a female will leave. That's the sound of wolves. Wolves, when they greet, are really noisy. It's really something to see them form what they call a knot. They'll come together and there'll be a lot of begging if there's been a fresh kill. The younger ones, that gray one is actually a younger one. It's begging for food to be uh, brought up from its parents' stomach. Probably not gonna happen, but there's a real social element to their lives. You can tell that they like each other, that they support each other. This is an alpha male just letting an upstart know, you know, this is your place. You're not going to get away with that. You can tell the positions by the tails. The dominant males will have their tails up. The subordinate animals will have their tails down. And if you're playing like a dog, it'll roll on its stomach. And by doing that, it's exposing its most vulnerable part, its neck and its stomach. And that stops the adult wolf or the dominant wolf from pursuing the attack. But they're very playful. Play fighting is going on all of the time. However, should a wolf steal a bit of food, the play fighting can get really real. They are, are quite aggressive around kills, which is great to see for a photographer. But most of the time, the pack seems to be quite neutral and seems to get along very well. They howl, and howling is a way of communicating. Sometimes you'll hear a really lonely howl. That's kind of saying, I'm over here, where are you? And if you listen, often you'll hear another howl far off in the distance, and eventually the wolves will come together. Then there's the rendezvous howl that you heard earlier, where they all come together, and it's noisy, and everybody's yelling. That's the lonely howl. That's the sound that we think of with wolves. And on that note, literally, I will stop the presentation and we will go back to full screen. And hopefully Stephanie will have some questions for me. Awesome. Thanks so much, Dave. That was a great presentation and you have lots of questions coming in, actually. <laughs> um, play stump the chump, huh? <laughs> yeah. Um, the first one coming in is from um, Stephen. He has asked, have wolves ever been a danger to humans? I've heard in earlier times in Europe that they may have been to lone travelers, but now not really. And coyotes not really ever a threat to humans, but your pets. Yes, of course. Um, okay. A lot of misconceptions there, Stephen. Uh, I have a friend who had a friend who was killed and eaten by wolves. And that happened with a uh, group of wolves 
uh, in Ontario that were captive. I won't name the spot. They've addressed the problem. She was a student at Guelph University. She went into the cage to feed them and the wolves killed her. So they are dangerous, especially habituated animals. Any animal that is habituated and loses its fear of people is potentially dangerous. And that applies to cattle, dogs, uh, and wolves. Wolf attacks, uh, when I was teaching 30 years ago, there hadn't been a wolf attack any place in North America. There have been a couple since, and there have been attacks by coyotes. Um, so they will attack if they're habituated, they lose their fear. Uh, you don't want to feed wolves, you don't want to feed coyotes. But going back to the mythology of wolves as major predators, you have to go back to Europe and the Black Plague and the Red Plague, when they had so many bodies and they didn't have freezer units like we do today, the bodies, they couldn't deal with them. So they were putting human beings basically out in the field and the wolves started to eat them. And as the population of humans declined a little bit and got sicker, wolves in Europe started to invade cities and towns. And the whole mythology of wolves and werewolves for that matter came into being at this period of time. Same thing happened in Africa when a plague hit there. There were so many dead Africans that they couldn't bury them. They left them in the, out in the bush, which actually was part of their traditions in any case. Lions started to feed them. It was just a short step from lions feeding on the carcasses of human beings to coming in and getting fresh carcasses, fresh people. So it does happen. And that's where it happened, how it happened in Europe. And they would follow people in uh, uh, their carts and their wagons. They would come into cities. It was a real problem. And it was an attitude that was brought over from Europe to North America. Now, um, on a real strange twist of fate, one of the best places in the world to see wolves today is Europe. They have got really good management techniques. They have tried to reintroduce the species. So places like Italy, Finland, France, they're now seeing wolves. There's even talk of reintroducing wolves into Scotland to help control the red deer. But there are wolves being seen on the edge of certain major cities in Europe. And they're not eating people and they're not hurting people because they've got a really positive attitude. It's a really great conservation story. Now we get to the coyotes. Well, coyotes have attacked people. There's no question. It's really rare. It's uh, not something you need to worry about. They will attack uh, small pets for sure. But studies have been, that have been done in Los Angeles and Chicago, and I think probably even now in Toronto in the GTA, show that the attacks by coyotes on pets are really rare. And with all due respect to cat owners, cats do more damage to the environment by killing small birds and mammals that, that when they're allowed to run free than they really should be allowed to do. And I think the coyotes help control that. They're doing our birds and our squirrels and our chipmunks a favor. So I, I do think you don't want to feed coyotes. You don't want them to be in your backyard, although they probably have been. Uh, I know I've had a coyote in our street uh, a few months ago. Um, I just embrace it. I think that it's a wonderful thing. Um, but I don't let, I didn't let my cat out. My cat's passed away, sadly. Uh, but and if I have young puppies, that's a concern. If you're walking your dog and you have a coyote and it approaches you, it is probably because it does not want to prey on the dog so much as it wants to go away from its den because dogs would have in the past and wolves would in the past would have raided coyote dens and destroyed them. And by the way, coyotes also raid foxes dens. And the other side of the story in Yellowstone, this is a long answer to a short question. I'm sorry about that, Stephen. The other story is, I said the high day, heyday of wolf viewing was about till 2010. There are as many wolves in the greater Yellowstone area now as there was 20 years ago. But the wolves kept killing each other off and they forced the other wolf packs to move out. So the packs are much more distant 
and they're smaller. You won't see packs of 20 animals like I was seeing. You'll see packs of maybe eight to 10 animals. And they're much more difficult to see because they're, they're not all in Lamar Valley where, where there used to be several packs. The coyote numbers, which were reduced by a huge percentage, have bounced back. They've adapted to the presence of the wolves. So you're likely to see coyotes and or wolves. And what has happened in Mississauga, I believe, I don't have evidence, but there have been so many people seeing foxes, including a fox <laughs> that despite all my efforts to see a fox, there was actually one of my neighbor's back door, like just inside of my fence. I didn't see it, but he got video of it. The foxes have come back. I think they've learned how to live with coyotes, which is really cool. Animals are adapting. So I hope that sort of straightens out the myth and puts some information about other myths that are out there. Next question, Stephanie. Sorry to be long-winded. No, 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 that's great. Um, Maria asked on Facebook, do we have koi wolves in the suburbs of Mississauga and Halton Hills? And I guess a question I have for you to take on to that is what are your feelings on the term koi wolves, Dave? <laughs> um, I, koi wolves is, is an expression that came into being about 40, 50 years ago, I guess, when people started to see these coyotes arriving into North America or into our area. And they certainly, you know, dogs have two breeding seasons a year. And the coyotes, the male coyotes, were particularly interested in the female dogs when they came into heat in the fall. And I think that led to this myth. There may have been some breeding, but not a lot. What we're getting is a new species that is developing. It's a mixture of wolf, probably some dog, and some coyote. It's a bit larger than the western coyote. I think in another who knows how many years, genetic testing will identify it as a new species. You can call them koi, wolf, koi wolves, brush wolves. Um, I'm going to call them koi, coyotes and more properly probably Easter coyotes, eastern coyotes. They're here to stay. They're certainly in this area. Um, they're around where you live and if you live in a city, you've got more coyotes closer to you than if you lived in the country because they're still widely hunted out in the country. And um, coyotes here seem to have adapted. So they, they learn, they've learned how to deal with traffic. They learn how to be around people. And those are the coyotes you want to keep. You don't want to bring in the coyotes from the countryside because they don't know the rules. And we've seen that with black bear, we've seen that with coyotes, we've seen that with deer. Animals that get established in the, in the cities and adapt to living with people are generally well behaved. And the best example is a bunch of grizzly bears that live in Italy of all places, called brown bears over there, that have lived there for centuries and continue to exist. And with only one exception, they've never been a problem with people. And you know, people know they're there. Great, thank you, Dave. Um, Ron has asked, uh, you stated that when ravens are around, there are often wolves around too. We have often met ravens on the Mizzy Lake Trail in Algonquin Park, so that perhaps means that we should watch out for wolves? I hope so. Wolves have been seen on the trail, but not by us, unfortunately. I've seen a couple of wolves on that trail. Uh, the raven thing works really well in Yellowstone, where you've got open spaces and you have a chance to see. If you were to see a flock of ravens uh, around a particular area, I think you probably got a kill. Ravens will certainly follow wolves, but ravens will also do other things too. I mean, they're very intelligent birds. And uh, ravens have learned, particularly on the Mizzy Trail, um, you, there was one that learned to bark like a dog for heaven's sakes they will hang around uh, people. So I think maybe you're seeing the same kind of behavioral trait, but instead of following wolves, they're following you. Um, great place to photograph Rafe Smizzy Lake Trail. Not the greatest place to photograph wolves. Uh, yeah, I think there was actually a raven that was fed on the north end of Mizzy Lake. And so I think it was hanging around there and hopping towards people because <laughs> it was being fed. That was the one that barked. Yeah. It was really strange. That's more strange. likely. <laughs> yeah. 
but you can sometimes hear wolves on Mizzy Lake Trail if um, you're listening. Yes, I, the only place I've ever called a wolf in was on Mizzy Lake Trail. I yeah. was out there, I was taking a guy, I was guiding a guy doing some moose calling and we weren't having any luck with moose and then we heard this wolf call. So I called and the wolf called back and then another wolf called. And the next thing you know, we saw this wolf trotting down the trail towards us. It was obviously a juvenile, it was like a yearling. Um, it was just an amazing thing. The first time I've ever called in a wolf and the only time I've ever called in a wolf. No, that's not true. I did call in wolves when I was a park uh, naturalist up in Algonquin Park back in, I think it was 67. I had a girlfriend that lived at the far end of the park from where I worked and I would hitchhike down to see her. And sometimes I got to drive with another ranger and he dropped me off at Rock Lake and then I go, well, I was coming back from her place and I got to the Rock Lake Road on Highway 60. If you know the park, you know where this is. There was a big blue school bus park there at the time. And I was alone. I, I was waiting for this guy to pick me up and he was late. So I started to sing. And being, you know, the creative guy saying the night has a thousand eyes. And I'm belting it out. And I'm not the world's best singer as, as none of you know, because you've never heard me sing. But suddenly I was answered by wolves. And it was a pack. And I thought, that's really cool. So I stopped singing and listened. And then they went away and I started singing again. They called again, but they were closer. They were up on a hill and now they were down. Well, now I was getting back to that European mindset that, oh my gosh, these are wolves and they're coming to see me. So I kind of backed up to the edge of that blue bus and I got a stick. And as I stood there, I could hear the toenails of the wolves. Now it's pitch black on the road as they circled around me. It was an amazing experience. Um, and then they left. I'd like to say they ate me, but they didn't. And I'm fine. You like that? <laughs> uh, so it was a really cool experience. That was my first experience with wolves. And I think the first time I really started to realize that they weren't as dangerous to people as we thought they were. Now, I did not know at the time what I met was a Ronklin wolf. It wasn't a gray wolf, because back in those days, the 60s, we just assumed they were gray wolves. It wasn't until John Taberge started to do studies in the 80s and early 90s, I think, that he started to question this. And I remember doing an interview with him for a magazine article I was writing, and he was telling me that he just sent the DNA to a California lab to see what was happening. And and from that, I think that changed everything. They changed the mounts of the wolves in uh, the Algonquin Park Museum. When you worked there, Stephanie, I think they were actually Algonquin wolves mounted. Mm -hmm. When I worked at the museum, they were gray wolves and they made a big change over there. You know, it was a big deal. Wow. And uh, the Raven had stories about them. It was quite a big, but had I known they were um, merely Algonquin wolves, I might not have been nearly as scared. That's an out and out lie, people. I would have still been scared. <laughs> um, Ron asked, what should you do if you meet up with a wolf on a trail? Make loud noises after shooting with your camera, of course. <laughs> yeah, shoot first. <laughs> um, I talked to them. I, I, I had the, the, the wolf that was on the uh, cover, the, so, the, the talk show. Um, that wolf... We were watching it, and this is in Yellowstone, and that walk, that wolf walked right up to me. I was at the, we were the last car in a line of people that were watching the wolves. We'd gotten out, I was with uh, my friend Gary. I think he was at the front of the vehicle. I was at the back of the vehicle. The trunk was open. I had my camera, I had my long lens, I had my short lens. And the wolf kept walking and walked right up to me and came within, well, Stephanie's image on the screen was about as close as the wolf got. It was that close. So close, I couldn't even get a picture with my short telephone lens. And it looked at me. And I talked to it. I just said, how you doing? You know, uh, we don't want any trouble here. Um, you're beautiful. You know, you're really quite a wolf. And it, and it struck me, his eyes were so yellow. They, they were like gold and they were piercing. And what it was, was a yearling wolf. And I assume it was looking for food because our trunk was open. That's what, what brought it in. 
Uh, about a week later, we were out uh, shooting in the same area and we saw the rangers come down and they had uh, shotguns with beanbags in them. And they fired the guns off in the air and then they fired at that wolf because it was becoming habituated and couldn't become quite dangerous. So it was really neat to see the management side of it, but to get that close to a wild wolf, uh, it's an experience you, you, you'll you never forget if you're ever that lucky. Um, if you are threatened by wolves or bears or whatever, make yourself look as big as you can. If you've got a camera, put it above your head, stand your ground, unless it's definitely showing signs that it's going to attack. If you run from a wolf, you're done. So, uh, I mean, they, we were photographing a, a captive coyote, my brother-in-law and I once, and it was a small coyote. It was like fox size. It was a young coyote, but it nipped my brother-in-law's leg. Didn't break the pants, didn't even break the skin, but its bite was so powerful, it pulled the muscle away from the bone. And we had to go to the uh, hospital in Yellowstone about uh, three or four days later to have him looked at to make sure there wasn't any serious damage. And that really impressed upon me two things. One, always have somebody else with you to get bitten. And two, uh, they can bite and they really can do a lot of damage. So you don't want to get in a position, but I wouldn't turn my back on them ever. Um, yeah, so if you have time, maybe for two more questions. And yeah. Linda, if you have any questions that you feel are interesting, you can bring them up as well. Um, one that I saw was from Elizabeth, and she has asked, how can we protect the wolves' population and their habitat? Uh, well, watching this helps. Uh, the government of Ontario uh, was going to instigate a wolf hunt again up near Algonquin Park. This was a few years ago. The outcry of the public was such that they decided that they would not go forward. The problem is with Algonquin Park, its deer population is growing again and the deer tend to winter up outside, uh, outside of the park and the wolves follow them. And that actually goes on both sides of the park. There's no way you can take a look at a wolf in Algonquin Park and say, that's a wolf and that's a coyote. They're just, you can't discern the differences. They're, they're considered wolves if they're, I think, 80% wolf and only 20% coyote, but the difference is not something that you or I, oh yeah, I've seen white wolves in Algonquin Park, I've seen black wolves in Algonquin Park, but I've seen almost white coyotes in Riverwood and I once saw a very black looking coyote in Riverwood just uh, two years ago. So color isn't going to be an effective way of telling. So the the government said basically, well, you can't tell which is which. So any wolves within a certain distance of Algonquin Park are now protected. Yes, we know some of them are coyotes, but we can't tell the difference. And there's only about 300 of these Algonquin wolves left in Algonquin Park. We need to protect them as best we can. And so by being sort of an agitator and saying we need to protect our animals, the biggest threat to wolves right now is in Idaho. Uh, the, you know, the Yellowstone wolves have expanded their range and Idaho has proposed, I believe I'm correct in this, a uh, hunt, hunting season that would effectively eliminate the wolves, could kill them all. Might not be easy to do, but there will be an outcry, I think, to stop it. It's political action and city people are making the decisions, driving the decisions. Uh, a lot more than ranchers and hunters and whatever that used to. The, the rules have changed in terms of conservation. Make yourself known. Go to Yellowstone, become a wolf watcher. It's an incredible experience. Go to Algonquin Park, go on one of the wolf howling tours when it's safe to do so. Participating in that. Enjoy having coyotes around your backyard. I mean, that's really where that type of help is needed. And the more you like them, you know, buy books on wolves, watch my videos on wolves. I don't know. Just, just say you're a wolf lover. And 
the wolves in Yellowstone are so well known that they have their own websites. You can follow their births to the deaths. It's a, it makes a Game of Thrones look like a, a Mickey Mouse clubhouse. Right? So it's just fascinating to, to learn about these wolves. One last question, Stephanie, and then we'll wrap it up. All right, one more question. Linda, I don't know if you found anything that you wanted to share or I can, you're just on mute, sorry. Sorry about that. No worries. Uh, so there's one here from Shelly on the, uh, on the chat. And it says, I had two friends circled by five wolves on a trail in Northern BC. Then they followed them back down the trail. Why would wolves do this? Wolves would do that because they're very curious animals. Just like that wolf that came up to me, wanted to see what you're all about. Um, if they weren't aggressive, I would say it's just curiosity. They might have also been escorting you away from a den. That's possible. It depends on what time of year. I've been escorted away from a den by a coyote in Riverwood. Um, it, it happens. Uh, it's not necessarily, there might be some aggression. Certainly five wolves and two people, the odds were not on the people's side had the wolves. And British Columbia wolves are big wolves. They're they're a good sized gray wolf. So I'm sure they could have handled uh, uh, people really well if they'd wanted to. I don't think, I think it's just curiosity. That, it's a wonderful thing about animals. Uh, they start to lose their fear and don't, don't become fully habituated. They can become quite curious and quite interesting to observe. So I hope that answers the question. Fascinating experience, great experience to have had. Wish I'd had it. <laughs> Although I would have been taking pictures for about two hours. <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you so much, Dave, for another great presentation. Um, and I think at Riverwood, too, this kind of answers a question of how we can protect wolves, but maybe their relatives, coyotes. The biggest thing you can do at Riverwood is stay on the trails. And if you bring your dog, keep them on leash. Um, that's a, a really big thing you can do. One thing to add. Yeah. Um, my daughters both have dogs and they're getting ticks on a regular basis. Um, if you are at Riverwood, please, please, or any park, any park where dogs are found, please be aware that uh, the tick problem this year seems to be growing. Stay on the trails you're much, much safer. Your dogs are much safer going off the trails. It's, um, it's not a smart thing to do. Mm -hmm. I would really strongly urge people to stay to the trails, but support Riverwood, but stay on the trails. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Dave, so much for a great presentation. Thank you, Linda, for uh, coming out on your holiday and volunteering with us. And thank you everyone for joining yes. today. Um, I hope everyone's enjoying their long weekend. What's left of it? Get outdoors, go see some coyotes somewhere <laughs> and uh, enjoy the weather. Thank you so much, everyone. Stay safe and we'll see you in the next one. Thanks everybody. Take care. Stay safe. Bye everyone.